Good morning. Uh, I'm Camille Thomas. I am the scholarly publishing librarian. Um, so I am a person on campus that you can contact if you're interested in open textbooks and open education resources. Um, and I just wanted to introduce Jasmine Roberts. She is a lecturer at the Ohio State University. It's okay. You don't have to say the. <laughs> I'm not a, go, go ahead, go ahead. At the School of Communications, <laughs> uh, and she is also the author of the open textbook, Writing for Strategic Communication Industries. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm here just to talk a little bit more about OER and open textbooks and how possibly that you can adopt them in your own classroom if you would like to. So in terms of what specifically I'm going to talk about the first part of uh, the workshop today, um, what's going on in higher education as it relates to affordability issues. I think we're well aware that there, there are very um, uh, problematic issues that are going on in terms of whether or not our students can afford higher education, so I'll go through that. Um, why textbooks are so expensive for our students, what can we do to kind of decrease that cost, talk a little bit more about the open textbook network as well as the library that's provided through the network, and then I'll talk a little bit more about those faculty reviews that we so, so, so need from you guys. Um, but before I begin all of that, I like to know who I'm speaking to. I don't like to just speak to strangers, quote unquote. So if we can just do quick introductions, your name, department, and more importantly for me, why are you here? So let's start on this <coughs> side of the room. I know I caught you at a bad moment. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Right. Um, and they can't afford it, and I'm just there like I can't really do anything in terms of that design. Yeah. Um, looking at what other ways in which uh, my students could uh, access this. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm Catherine Jacks from Hospital in Utah, Metro, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm teaching international uh, retailing. And then my problem is the textbook change every other year. I know. Isn't that annoying? Yeah. So my students have to keep upgrading like the text like every year. Right. I have to. So I have used four different versions of textbooks in the past six years. Yeah, yeah. So is Is it the same textbook but just a newer edition? Yes. Yeah. They they may put the comic book to the right. book on the book. So that will be hard for my students in year two thousand uh, seventeen to buy the e commerce. Exactly. They feel like the textbook and the knowledge, technology mentioned in the textbook is so old. Right, in right. This generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking for um, online textbooks mm -hmm. because we should probably update the content faster. Yes, yes, live. So I look forward to seeing what resources is there. Absolutely. All right, thank you so much. Let's go over here. Uh, I'm Dr. Carlson. I'm in the Department of Geosciences. I've Thanks. taught for 25 years. Uh -huh. uh, every year, I teach about 1,000 students. Wow. Uh, unaided with me. Wow. So I use Blackboard and uh, uh, I'm currently using an ebook, which mm -hmm. is commercial. <coughs> and I'm always complaining, even with the commercial books, that they <laughs> should be $50 max. Yeah. And unfortunately, uh, places that sell them, like the bookstore, doesn't really tell the students what actually is the best deal. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so they spend sometimes three times what they should. I also have a, a couple of kids in college, mm -hmm. so I'm painfully aware of <laughs> <laughs> what's going on. And, and, uh, and I'm here because I'm, I'm curious. I want to find out a little bit more about this. Open textbooks, absolutely. Thank you so much. Right here. Um, I'm Dee Gilson from English. Um, I'm brand new in English. Uh -huh. um, I teach mostly creative writing. And we don't use a lot of expensive textbooks in English, um, but our anthologies tend to be really expensive and they transition like every year, or every two years. Um, and we usually end up using only like a piece or two from it. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in open access for that, like nice. not making students buy a whole Norton anthology of something right. when we're just going to read two short stories from it or whatever. I know, right. Um, but also from the flip side, as a working writer, I like don't want. I, I like that this um, pays writers yeah. and that like authors get them the their due and publishers mm -hmm. get their due. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm interested in that now. Okay, 
All right. Thank you so much. That's a really good point that you made, actually. Thank you. Yes. I'm Jenny Lehman. I'm a full-time PhD student, uh -huh. almost done. Yay. And, um, and part-time instructor uh -huh. in the personal financial planning department. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in this because I'm about to have a faculty position somewhere right. else where I'll have some say, if not all of the say, yeah. what textbook is adopted. And mm -hmm. I've seen the rise from you know, when I was an undergrad mm -hmm. and um, grad school and then mm -hmm. working and then coming back. Yeah. And in my field, I mean, they change every year because we're dealing with tax. Yeah, yeah. And That's a good I point. When I actually income tax accounting, the textbook was like $350. Wow. And had to have it because they also have the homework online and all that. Right. package. Right. So, and, you know, and it wasn't a deal where you could share it with somebody because you're having to do Yeah, because you have to do the homework individually. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, I'm with D, with that balance. I mean, I do want the writers to get paid and all mm -hmm. that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some way to bring the cost down, even if it's not zero, because zero is awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm on both sides. Right, right, yeah. right, right. But some way bringing that cost down to where it's reasonable. On, yes, sir. On the yeah. books, uh -huh. uh, I've gone through this, you know, with the publishers trying to mm -hmm. get new editions. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely not. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they will so do that. They do that. They like it. Yeah. <laughs> right here. Hi, I'm Barbara Allison. Um, I'm in the Family and Consumer Sciences Education Program mm -hmm. in the College of Human Sciences. And honestly, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. So that's why I'm here. Good. And good. I can relate to what everybody else has said. I mean, right. we're all in the same boat. With, yeah. You know, our students paying these exorbitant prices mm -hmm. and they keep changing, and then we have to keep changing our <laughs> content mm -hmm. or whatever. So. Okay. That's why. All right. That's a good reason why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, I'm Marissa Carter. I'm from Communication Studies. I'm a professor. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. um, this has a special place in my heart because when my husband was in college, mm -hmm. he couldn't afford textbooks. Yeah. So he never bought textbooks. Right. And I always feel like, well, if you couldn't afford it, I mean, this right. just breaks my heart. So. Yeah. So it's a little personal for you. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. For me, too. And you're going to find out why. Yes. I'm Laura Hines. I'm here at the University Library. We're in the process of getting a new master's degree program mm -hmm. uh, through the process accepted. So I want to encourage the use of OERs. Oh, yes. Thank you. Very good. Right here, maybe? Yes. Okay, so I'm Brock Williams from mm -hmm. Math Department. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a tiny bit of experience this year with using uh, the OpenStax College Algebra. Okay. Book because um, I got sucked into teaching low credit <laughs> college algebra out of Estacada. <laughs> okay. Because it's early college high school and all the experimentation and trying to get things out there. So it's been a lot of fun. So I got there once a week. And mm -hmm. But one of the things that, that um, came up was so they had a big grant working on the East Love and stuff. And when they first got the grant, Tech promised that they wouldn't charge tuition, like the dual credit stuff. Mm -hmm. And the school district said, you know, don't worry, we'll cover all the textbooks, right? And then, of course, they realized that, you know, when, when right. $350 college algebra book. Yeah, yeah. So, so, that, so it was suggested to me that, <laughs> that if we come up with a, with a book that didn't cost the school district a fortune, they would appreciate that. Right. So, so that's why I've been using that. And, the other, other thing I'm sort of curious about is I teach a lot of our graduate courses for in-service teachers. Uh -huh. There's a big market for, for high school teachers who want their 18 graduate hours in math so they can go teach dual credit or mm. teach you know, at the community college or whatever. And we have lots of classes that we teach for that. And what we've tried to do in the past is use old editions they can buy off Amazon, but sometimes Right, this this semester where where we, the current edition is the fourth edition. I'm using the third edition. The kid keeps ordering it from Amazon. They keep sending him the second edition because oh, wow. they write they, it's all just filed in the old pile. Yeah. And and so maybe there's a better way to deal with some of that problem. Yes, there is a better way. <laughs> all right, thank you. Right here. I'm Mike McCurdy in uh, Human Development and Family Studies. Mm -hmm. um, and what I see students do is either at the end of the semester they complain that they never used the textbook, or after they do horrible on my first exam, then they go buy the textbook. Yep. Uh, yep. And, and so uh, I see the students struggling. 
Yeah, you see the academic impact that high cost textbooks can, can have. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm Mary Dallin Law. Um, I have three reasons. The first is um, I have been a proponent of open access movement for many, many years as yeah. an institutional repository manager, and I just feel like this all kind of it does. goes along with that whole idea of making information and resources available to the most amount of people that you can possibly capture. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, as a societal good. Mm -hmm. And then, um, second of all, I was a broke law student yeah. who took all of my textbooks out of a communal like bin that we had at my law school, or I wouldn't have had textbooks. Yeah. So I can totally understand that. And as a professor teaching students, who I know some of them have money to burn, and mm -hmm. others are, are poor like me. And mm -hmm. so I don't mm -hmm. want to have to require them to put out money that I'm not sure that they have. Right. And um, I'm also an online student in mm -hmm. Casper, and I just paid wow. $121 for a book myself. Wow. So, um, and that just happened this semester. So mm -hmm. it's all kinds of personal to me. Yes, yes. Um, so I just think it's really important. All right, thank you. Do you want to enter? Yep. But, but, I'm but. I'm but. Department. <laughs> I just experience librarian, and I'm here to observe and listen. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And then we had one more that came in. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, in a human development and family studies. Nice. And so uh, I had uh, spent approximately eight years as the associate chair, so I spent a good bit of time in terms of textbook selection mm -hmm. for our courses and programs. And then for uh, uh, one of the um, courses that I taught, I worked with a publisher and generated custom textbook. Okay. We did, did a paper version for about five years, and then two years ago we shifted to an online version. Of okay. That. So this to me just seems the next possible extension. Yeah, let's hope. All right, I, th I think we got everyone. Excellent, and then one last thing that I kind of want to clarify before I officially begin. I want to clarify what this workshop is not. So I do not work for a publishing company. Okay? I'm not a textbook publishing uh, representative. Okay, so I'm not gonna try to force you guys to adopt a particular textbook. On the flip side, I'm not gonna bash those who are in the textbook publishing industry. Right, so if you, if you kind of want to have that conversation, you know, you can talk to me personally, but this isn't what this workshop is for. And then the last thing here, um, when I'm talking about open educational resources, it might work for some people in here. It might not, okay? My job here is just to raise awareness about what is OER, what is open textbooks, and hopefully at some point in time that you can adopt it, all right? So um, as you can see here, that's me with my, my, stu my students, excuse me. Um, I know I look like one of my students. I'm a fairly young instructor. Um, but the reason why I'm here, guys, is I, I truly care about my students. My students, they are the folks who drive me in my profession. And I think the reason why I have such a passion for my students is because, like was said earlier, I can relate so much to their experience. Um, and I want to share a particular experience that I had at the University of Michigan where I got my undergraduate degree. I was enrolled in an intro to mass media uh, course, uh, COM 101, and I'm looking through the syllabus, right? And what's, what's the textbook? Figuring out what's the price. Um, looked or went to the bookstore and I found that it was like $130. Like, okay, absolutely not. So I go on to Amazon and I look at the price. It was $116, only a little bit lower. And so then I go to the professor's office hours and I asked him, I said, is there any way you can put this textbook on course reserves? And he said, sure, but I also noticed that he kind of gave this odd look, like why is she asking me this question? And he <coughs> followed up by saying, well, I just want you to know, Jasmine, that not all professors are going to do this. And I think to myself, okay, not sure why you needed to say that, but okay, thank you. And then he followed up by saying the assumption is that if you can afford to attend the University of Michigan, you can afford this textbook. And so I just remember leaving his office hours just feeling so belittled. Um, his tone is very, very condescending. And now that I'm kind of on the other end, I want to make sure my students don't feel that way, that they know that I care about their experience um, while I'm teaching there. Um, and also another reason why I'm here is because this is a fundamental value that I share, that higher education really should be affordable and accessible to all. Um, but unfortunately, it seems like some of the systems um, within higher education are kind of exasperating those barriers that we see outside of you know, university communities, particularly in marginalized communities. Um, the cost factor that we're seeing in higher education um, is huge, that being that barrier. Um, over two and a half million people who come from low income and middle income backgrounds unfortunately could not complete their college education simply because they could not afford it. 
right? So we're not talking about a lack of academic you know, skills or anything like that. It's simply because they could not afford to attend college. And I think that's extremely, extremely problematic. There's two and, two and a half million doctors, two and a half million veterinarians, two and a half million academics that we could have reached, but they dropped out because they couldn't afford college. Um, also here, as you can see in this chart, the US uh, funding or funding for higher education over the past couple of decades, it's, it's fluctuated quite a bit, right? But the past decade, it's like declining. Um, but we're seeing here tuition is steadily increasing. Right? So I think that's one contributing factor to why this is such a problem in higher education. Um, here in Texas, at least in the 2013-2014 academic year, of the financial aid that was provided, 60% of it was in loans. And I'm sure we are well aware of some of the news stories that we hear about students not able to pay back their loans, defaulting on their loans. Right? So this is a problem, obviously, here in Texas as well. Um, in terms of this year, this um, uh, two years ago, I guess I should say, um, over half of recent college graduates in Texas graduated with some type of debt, particularly $26,000 in debt. Texas Tech, it's a little bit better for you guys. I think it's $22,500 approximately, right? But that's still money that the students have to pay back. And so now I'm thinking to myself, well, what, what exactly are they paying for? What's, what's contributing to this debt, okay? Um, from a nationwide perspective, as we can see here in terms of credit card debt, it's been pretty steady, but I'm sure you guys are aware, aware uh, given the news media coverage, that student loan debt has soared, it's surpassed credit card debt. Okay, how many folks in here have student loan debt? Yeah, yeah, okay. Not fun, is it? Not at all. Okay, oops. All right, so now that I've kind of established the affordability issues within higher education from a, a macro perspective, these are some of the areas that we can visit here in terms of figuring out what's contributing to this high cost. So I wish I can come to my students and say, hey, I can give you free tuition. You don't have to pay to, to, to go here. Okay, I wish, even for my sake, I wish I could say that to myself, right? Wouldn't have to pay off my student loans. Uh, but which of the following factors can we control as instructors? Obviously, books and supplies, okay? Um, so what I would like us to do right now, if you kind of can, get with someone near you and discuss the following questions or answer the following questions. Um, number one, how do you choose textbooks for your own courses, if you even use textbooks? Okay. Secondly, um, how can you assess whether or not uh, students are actually reading the textbooks? And then lastly, um, do you actually provide or give any feedback, or, I'm sorry, do the students actually give any feedback about the textbook that you have assigned? So I'll give you guys about five minutes just to kind of discuss this with someone next to you. <coughs> How many textbooks do you typically review when you are in that review process? You said about 10? Um, I've, I don't know, three years I've reviewed uh, tons of these Sometimes yeah. a chapter, uh, sometimes the whole book. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I've written test uh, banks for yeah. three months. Right. And, uh, and I've done, I think, it twice. And I calculated how much I was making an hour to I'm teaching a new online course this mm -hmm. semester, so I read six books. Yeah. To choose the one. Wow. So, um, yeah. Okay, again, so I, there were some of them that were a good chapter and I could see it was not going to work for me. Mm -hmm. But for the others that were, you know, sort of split them in half the top three, then it really was a matter of the uh, same quality. Right. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their, uh, 
class, they'll have three papers, uh -huh. which mm -hmm. they're required to receive for all of those. Mm -hmm. That's 45% of their grades, exams are 55%. Yeah. And each of the exams, 40% of the questions come from three. Mm -hmm. so, Uh, because this is new, it's only 50 students. Okay. I have 200. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, in the fall, I ran 600 simultaneously. Yeah. So I had to have this, uh, everything laid out, mm -hmm. blackboard, uh, and uh, through the years, I've also developed my own course notes. Mm -hmm. And they, I fit with those, and I, and I tell them, look, it's time to fill in the rest. Yeah. Yeah. What I tell them through their learning modules is uh, that anything that I'm giving them in terms of PowerPoint and media is not mm -hmm. So I'm trying, I'm not going to summarize all of that together. Yeah. Uh, because I'm also trying to make anything they view online right. as value added. Yes. As yes. And they, they make those value judgments. So right. So right. So uh, it's called family life education ethics, and it's for people who will likely end up doing, say, Nice. What about you guys? How do you choose your textbooks for your courses? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Really? Oh, okay. Yeah. Right, right. So you do get that student feedback a little bit. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Uh huh. Yep. I know. Because in a way, they kind of they kind of take it out on you a little bit. Like they, that affects their perception of you as an instructor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. Right. Students are not getting enough historical information. Yeah, yeah. Mm hmm. And then I, because I always have limited class time, mm -hmm. I cover yep. the students want to learn new things. Absolutely, but yeah. Without the foundation of learning what's in the past, right. it's hard for them to appreciate exactly. new and innovation. Yeah, so yeah. Last, so I, I tried to get the textbooks, and last time I tried with no textbooks. Right, right. You know, a balance between the two, where you're like not tied to this yeah, textbook, but you're still using it in some way, and it fulfills your course. Yes. Right. Yeah. So I can use the class time to talk. Yeah. New Yeah. All right. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. I'm gonna move on for, for time's sake, but I am interested in what you have to say. All right, let's go ahead and get back together. So what did you guys discuss? Anyone wanna share? How do you select your textbooks or select textbooks for your courses? What's the process like? Daunting, right, sometimes? No. Tiring, no? Maybe no. that's just me. <laughs> no, because I've done it so long. Yeah, and, and true. I, I kind of know, I've seen all of these things. Yeah. And uh, I guess the, some of the faculty are lazy, so they leave it up to me. Oh. And then I'm the big shareholder. <coughs> I teach okay. 600 out of the, or I teach like 90% uh, of the students anyway, so I said, whatever you say doesn't count, I pick the book. Right, right. No, okay. not really. Yeah, 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 I know. I know you're being sarcastic. I know, I know, yeah. I know. Yep, yep. Like we don't fight over books. Yeah, yeah, and you shouldn't. You really shouldn't. Anyone else? How do you select your textbooks? Well, yes. I teach a course in curriculum. Yeah. Oh, there's there's thousands and thousands of books in curriculum. Right. And it really takes me a long time to, to narrow it down. Yeah. I ended up making a course packet. Yeah. From a lot of different books. Selections and what have so you. So I agree. It is overwhelming. Yeah. When it you're in be. a broad field like that. Right. 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 Yeah. In terms of for oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. kind of use the reverse engineering principles oh, okay. in my course. So right. we're out at the end. After 
after four months, what is it that students should be able to see and yeah. know? Yeah. Then choose my course topics. Right. And then choose the book that's based, based upon those topics. So right. I know some other people talk about they choose the book first. And mm -hmm. Week one is chapter one, week 16 is chapter 16. So, mm -hmm. But I, my perspective is um, I, I don't design the course, the course on, the on the book. Yeah. Uh, the book is just a tool. Yes. To help Absolutely, absolutely. Is that is that referred to as the backward designs approach? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. I have a system. They call uh, some publishers told me I had a systems approach. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I said I don't know what that is. <laughs> I, I, go, I go from chapter one to twenty-three. Yeah, example. yeah. So I don't teach the books in order. Right, right, right. Okay, all right. And the second uh, question here: Do you guys actually know whether or not the students are reading the textbook? You're shaking your head. No. no. <laughs> in, my, in my graduate classes I teach for teaching, uh -huh. um, the, the two sequences that I teach are very, very readable, you know, lively sorts of books. Right. Really, really good, easy to read books. And I picked out specifically for them because it's online and they're, they never see them and, and they, I know they're reading those. Yeah. They're probably not watching the videos that right. I killed myself making fun of. <laughs> 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 I, I, I think they're they think actually reading the book and not watching what I do. Yeah, yeah. In, everything else, so, so calculus and the, all the lower divisions with math classes and stuff. Yeah, yeah they're, not, they're not cracking the book at all. Mm. And they've been systematically trained not to. Mm -hmm. right? so, so when I talk to freshmen, and I see this in my own kids, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They, there, there are textbooks in the school room when they were in high school. You're right. right? But they, they were never assigned a textbook. Yeah. And they worked off of worksheets that yeah. the teacher provided. And all of our lower division classes work is all online. Yeah. Right. And so what I know right, what they do, they, they come to class, they write down everything I said, mm -hmm. whether they understood it or not. Yep. They go home and they, they pull up the online homework because that's the thing that gets graded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they, they work through the online homework problem. They see a problem, then they frantically scour my their notes. Notes. Sometimes, probably, sometimes the book, right? Mm -hmm. They don't just read it. They just skim through trying to find <laughs> the answer. The same problem with yeah. the numbers change. Yeah. Then yeah. change the numbers to fit the homework problem and then you know, right. Course. Right. And, and then repeat until they finish the homework. Yeah. So the idea of them actually opening the book and reading it mm -hmm. is a completely foreign concept. Mm -hmm. And I like how you pointed out the, the huge transition from going to high school where that book is either provided to you. It's not necessarily assigned, but it's provided, right? And you're doing your homework on worksheets and then transitioning to having to buy your textbook and doing homework online. That's, that's a struggle for a lot of students. Absolutely. Maybe one more. Yes. No, but, no, 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 no. <laughs> um, I, I am a financial planner. Right. And I think more needs to be done at the high school level to right. teach budgeting for college. Mm -hmm. and part of that includes the textbook. Yeah. I mean, I don't mean it to sound like you're a professor. I don't mean it that way. At right, all, right, right. I mean, there are, and there are some classes you can get by with. Mm hmm, mm hmm. So you don't. It, I mean, I'm teaching estate planning right now. Yeah. You have to read that stuff. Right. And it's complicated. Up PowerPoints later. It's, it's doing yourself as a service. Yeah. Oh, wow. Grades. I mean, they, you know, it's just not enough. You have to read. And they figure that out, if not right away, so yeah. Those tests. So, yeah. Um, so, I mean, we have to have a textbook. Yeah. And we have Dalton, um, which is part of, well, money education is part mm -hmm. of the books, but they do a CFP review mm -hmm. course. So, I mean, it's also certain material they're having in their. Exam, yeah. Being a Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. But okay. I think that needs to be part of the whole. Here's how to budget for college. You've got this and this. Oh, and textbooks, and they can be. But you know, let's average. Let's call them two hundred dollars a piece. Mm -hmm. Some of them go for fifty bucks, but then there's that one that's going to be three fifty. Right. Better. Right. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. So when you take five classes. You've got to add a thousand dollars to that semester. That's crazy. Bucks. Yeah. Yeah. But why does it have to be like that? We'll, we'll, no, we'll, we'll, yeah, yeah. And for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and move on just to the third question here. Do you guys actually uh, get feedback from students about, oh, yes, yes, okay, I want to hear from you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, so the, in the difference, a lot of the books that we use aren't, they don't look like textbooks. Yeah. Right? So, like, I'm teaching Thomas Coates this semester or Roxane Gay. So, right. They, they're books like you would get at Barnes and Noble um, or at Amazon or wherever. Right. Um, and yeah, I always, at midterm and at the end of the semester, have students write about each book. Oh, okay. Um, and 
what they found valuable about it or didn't. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what do you, do you remember? Do you recall what they were saying about it? The textbooks in general. Um, they, since they're so like top <coughs> Yeah. Okay. So okay. Like, Fair enough. They usually right. Tend to like them. Yeah. More, and they're cheaper than that, you know. Like Absolutely. My textbook's like sixteen dollars. Right, so, right. Yeah. Versus $150 yeah, yeah, for something. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, great discussion. This was awesome. Um, so we are all well, well aware that textbooks are very, very high for our students. They cost a lot of money for our students. This photo here is of a student with her textbooks that she needed for a full academic year. In total, it cost $1,200. Okay, and I believe that's about as much as Texas Tech students should budget in, or at least that's what's reported on the website. Um, textbooks are increasing a lot and they have increased substantially over the past few years. Four times the rate of inflation. Crazy. Okay. Um, like I just said, Texas Tech students should budget in about $1,200 for um, uh, course materials and textbooks and what have you. But I'm wondering what could they have used that money towards instead of textbooks? You know, so keep that question in, in mind. Right, food, right, more it. So um, at my respective university, we actually asked students their opinions about high cost textbooks. I'm sure you can guess what they said. So we're just gonna watch this a little bit here. I think it's ridiculous. I get most of my textbooks um, through Ohio Link, so a lot of them I can get for free just running them, but a lot of the language ones I know, like my Spanish textbook, I have to go pay 200 bucks today. I think that there are a lot of good alternatives to the textbooks. Usually I think they're pretty overpriced, around you know, $200 for a CalCare 10 textbook. Um, I know there are a lot of good options like Chegg and other places you can go to rent them or get them for lower prices, but I do think, especially since they're in SSC, that they should be a lot lower. The cost of new textbooks is like, over a hundred dollars which is ridiculous and then on top of that a lot of times they make you like pay for your homework i think they're too high honestly for some classes like chemistry which is like insanely high just for one class they're really annoying they're super expensive and <laughs> i feel like going to the school with these standards of already paying so much for classes and pay so much for textbooks it's a really large hassle i think they're ridiculously high often especially for biological sciences and other sorts of sciences like that I've always appreciated when they're not that bad, especially when professors maybe don't even assign textbooks because it can be such a huge waste of money, it feels like. Any other school-related stuff like um, tutoring services or school supplies or just any other living-related things like buying food and stuff, like there's a lot of different costs for students living on campus. I've been thinking about uh, doing a study abroad trip and I would definitely like to be saving some money for that. I could probably like put it more towards like clubs and other things or even like uh, going out in my like, town or experiencing like more stuff around campus. I could use the money towards my rent or towards my food or towards other supplies for those classes. I'm kind of a big nerd so I'd probably spend that money on books I actually want to read sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just so you know, it does not look like that in, in Ohio right now. It's not sunny. It's, it's snowing, unfortunately. <laughs> so we don't have great weather like here in Texas. But yeah, I mean, just the point is students are not a fan of these high cost textbooks. They are making these value judgments. They are thinking to themselves, I could have spent this money on food. I could have spent it on my rent. I could have spent it on something else that perhaps was a little more enjoyable. I went to an open education conference in California this past October, and there was an amazing student panel um, uh, about students, excuse me, who uh, were using OER in the classroom. And one student said, I was so fortunate that my professor actually used OER in the classroom because um, instead of paying $80 for a textbook, I was able to put my child in a basketball class. So when you, when you put a human to this issue, it's really hard to ignore that, that this is very, very problematic and this is a real issue for a lot of our students. And then one last thing here, I know it's sounding really, really gloomy. I've already talked about that students get really creative, so they're looking at that price tag, they're like $110, I'm not gonna do that. So what can I do to still access that textbook, right? So there's a couple of things that they do do, which I'm sure you all are well aware of. They're gonna purchase that older edition, which in my class, um, if I don't use OER in the classroom, I will tell my students you can purchase the older edition. It might not have the most recent examples to illustrate our class concepts, but you can go ahead and do that. My name isn't on the textbook, so I don't care, I'm not profiting from this. 
Um, but of course, if they're not using the most recent examples, they might not be able to make those connections between the concepts that you're teaching and what's going on outside of the university community. Um, they can delay the textbook or purchasing the textbook, I should say. Uh, but like someone was saying earlier, you know, they might fail their first exam and then purchase the textbook. Oh, I, I kind of need this now, right? They can forego purchasing the textbook altogether, but of course there's a risk with that, right? The academic impact of not buying the textbook. Uh, I used to do this when I was in college, sharing the textbook, but what's the disadvantage of doing that? When you're sharing the textbook with your roommate or perhaps someone else who's in the class, what do, what's a huge disadvantage of, of that strategy? Yeah. Well, a critical time should be one exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Right. <laughs> so essentially access. You, you still have limited access. And the fifth one here is separated on purpose because it's illegal, right? And so we don't want to encourage our students to do anything illegal, downloading a PDF from, you know, the internet. Um, and this quote, I, I, I find it hilarious because this is one of the justifications that a student from the University of Minnesota said. He, he justified not buying a new French book because he's like, I mean, French, I mean, can you blame him, right? Again, make, making those, those value judgments. All right, so uh, I want to talk more specifically about the impact that high-cost textbooks have on our students academically, because this affects all of us in this room. Um, so this is out of a report from the Florida Student Te Textbook Survey. Um, they uh, took the survey twice. I'm going to report on the most recent results in 2016. So almost or a little over two-thirds of students from that st survey reported not buying the uh, textbook at all. Okay. Um, because textbooks can be so expensive, almost half of them said they had to take fewer courses because they just could not afford to spend $1,000 on textbooks for four classes. Um, some students are not registering for a specific class. So at Ohio State, we actually have a website where professors you know, post their syllabus and students will go on to the, the, the uh, website, see what the textbook is, and they're like, oh, not registering for that class because the textbook is too high. I actually hear my students talk about this in class. Did you register for so-and-so's course? No, did you see how much that textbook costs? I'll just take it later on. Or I'll try to see if I you know, don't have to take it. Okay. Um, because high textbooks um, are having an academic impact on our students, um, they might not do or perform as well in the classroom. Some of them will drop out of the course completely or even fail the course, okay? Um, a lot of this can and will impact enrollment numbers, which affects us, right? Especially for my non-tenure track faculty, my contractual faculty, their livelihood is based upon how many students sign up for their course, whether or not a course is offered. So once more, this isn't just affecting our students, this can and will and has affected enrollment. Um, another quote from that um, a panel that I keep talking about, I'm actually going to show you guys a clip of it. It's an amazing panel that took place. Um, one of the students reported that uh, she knew of people um, who changed their major completely because the textbooks, the course materials were way too expensive. We're losing our students, guys, just to, just a textbook, just because, you know, it costs too much, right? Um, one last video, sorry, one last gloomy video that I want to show you from the University of Minnesota. This student basically talks about the specific impact that high-cost textbooks has on his academic career. But I promise it gets better. This isn't a gloom and doom workshop. This is a student at Carlson. Uh, right now I'm a freshman, so I'm pre-major, but I'm looking to study uh, entrepreneurial management and maybe a minor in management information systems. I actually decided to buy only two of the required textbooks um, after kind of poking around and really asking people and taking the courses uh, because I simply couldn't afford it. Um, that's when I said I took out two alternative loans from my brothers. Uh, that was to pay for the cost of textbooks on top of um, the tuition. And um, so I, I have two of the required textbooks. I'm sharing a third textbook between. <laughs> Two of my roommates and a guy down the hall, <laughs> and um, yeah, it's and the other two I just I don't really worry about because I mean I don't have enough money for that right now to be honest. But it, it becomes bothersome when you have to travel, you know, to another dorm just to read your own textbook. Um, but I'd say for. I mean, there's some times where they're like, I, I need the book right now, I can't, I can't give it to you. And so I just kind of have to um, 
twiddle my thumbs until late at night when they're done, and then I can read the book, and then either like get started on sleep or something. Like sometimes I've had to stay up as late as 3, 4, or 5 a.m., and then go to sleep, get three hours, get up, and go to class, because, I mean, that's when the textbook was available to me. You know, I could have focused on my studies and more, and studied more than I wanted to, um, but I mean, you know, a lot of the times it's just you got shorted on sleep or you, you didn't have enough time to study as you wanted because I had to pass the textbook off to someone else that needed it. It's just kind of challenging because it's like, you know, it's, you, you, you kind of, you're struggling to get enough money and it's always kind of the back of your mind to worry uh, throughout your day that do I have enough money to pay for my textbooks or pay my brothers back kind of thing. So it's, it's difficult. Next year, um, uh, unfortunately, I think next year is going to be a lot like this semester, where it's um, uh, I'm going to have to uh, well, I'm going to have to find another job because I'm moving actually outside of the dorms because it's cheaper. Um, so I I have to find a job because my job right now requires that I uh, live in one of the dorms, and I can't do that because I can't afford it, kind of thing. So. Um, I have to find a new job next semester. I have to probably continue with the paid research thing. Um, and then I might actually end up having to schedule my courses around what my roommates and people that I know are taking. Because if they have a shared textbook, then uh, I might have to take that class kind of thing. Because it's if it's something that maybe doesn't interest me, but it fulfills a requirement or elective, I might have to take that. because. That's 200 less dollars in textbooks. Um, well, uh, coming from Michigan, Minnesota, uh, you, you know, you always, no matter where you go, college is going to be expensive. But so I, I, I pull up and go to Minnesota and I unpack all my things. And then I've already done all the, uh, the tuition based stuff where, you know, uh, they have it on my U, you know, you turn in all that. So I'm like, okay, I'm done. And then textbooks rolled around, and uh, I wasn't <laughs> quite ready for that. Um, I, I remember totaling up all of my uh, my textbooks and the cost of them, and it was kind of like that's the second tuition. <laughs> I can't can't quite afford that. I'm so kind of shocked because I I'm completely broke from buying textbooks last year. So I have to take out a loan and kind of manage which ones I'm going to buy. And it's just kind of, it always, it always the second tuition, I call it, always kind of uh, surprises me. Yeah. Just this past year, I, I've probably spent in the ballpark of $1,000, and I haven't even bought all of the required texts that they told me to buy. It's been, uh, yeah, been difficult. Initial thoughts from the video. Any initial reactions, responses? Oh, everyone's face is like, oh, right. I think so, we. Oh, go ahead. What do you think about renting? That's a good question, and we're going to talk about renting in, in just a second. That renting is a way to kind of cut down on that cost. Absolutely. Is that? I thought I saw a hand up, but yeah, renting. Renting is obviously a, a viable option. Yeah. Any other? reactions to this? Yeah, I think sometimes we underestimate what students are going through, you know, in order to sit right in front of us and engage with us as instructors. Uh, but it's not all gloom and doom. I promised you guys that it was, wasn't going to be just that. Oops. All right, so I think it's very, very clear that what we have here is an extremely broken system, mm -hmm. right? Very, very broken. Um, and I want to take the opportunity to kind of describe what's going on in the publishing industry, particularly describe some of the publishing models. Um, so we have your traditional textbook publisher, right, who is going to invest a lot of money into creating and producing a textbook. And they recoup that cost through, of course, sales. Okay? And then the people who actually write the textbook, the authors, they get you know, a small fraction of that profit through royalties. Okay, that's the tradition. Anyone ever authored a textbook through a traditional? How, what was your experience like? I'm, I'm curious. Uh, it was okay. It was okay? Okay, yeah. no, it's fine. Okay, all right. Someone else? Yes? Uh, I edited a lab manual for the department, mm -hmm. and all the royalties came to the department. Oh, so it was a kickback. 
Right. So, and we then rolled that back into the classroom. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Would you say that's a, a fair? Well, the book was 15 bucks or something. Yeah. So it's, we did our own in house class. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that's the traditional model that we typically see. Um, of course, we have to tell people what and how they can use this information. We put some type of copyright on it. Um, they can't edit or change the information or profit from it. Um, there are a variety of other models that we can take a look at as well. So I can go online, for instance, and just put together a course packet and what have you, but I'm not necessarily getting paid for that. I'm not necessarily telling my audience what they can do to that um, or with that information. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of things that perhaps are a bit, a bit wrong with that model. Oh, it's not peer reviewed. Right, so we can't really attest to the quality of that type of model. Um, here's another one where we have a funder who actually invests in the production of a textbook. There's a huge contingency, however. Um, the textbook has to be free forever. Okay? Um, and so that publisher then takes the money from the foundation or the funder um, to produce that textbook. And sometimes, actually oftentimes, whoever is writing that textbook will get some type of stipend, not necessarily royalties, but some type of stipend. Okay. Um, and in terms of the funders, I do want to explain this really quickly, some of where this uh, funding comes from. It can come from universities like the provost's office or in the form of a grant. It can also come from actual foundations like the Hewlett Gates Foundation, uh, federal funds, state funds. It can come from a variety of sources. Okay. But we're missing one thing from this model. What are we missing here? Yes. I think we're missing the bookstore. Yes, yes. The yeah, yep. Missing the bookstore. And then what else? Students. Students, mm -hmm. yes. What about licensing? We're missing, we're missing that part. Copyright. Yeah, copyright. Okay. And this is where the Creative Commons licensing kind of comes into play, for open textbooks, that is. So this is how we license our information, our material. So copyright basically is telling the reader all rights are reserved. Okay, you can't edit this information, you can't profit from it. With a lot of open textbooks, we have what's called the Creative Commons licensing. So essentially, some rights are reserved. You can edit and modify it to a certain degree. Okay. You might have seen this license on other websites or in other textbooks. This is from MIT's MOOCs website. Here's an example of a Creative Commons license. There are about six of them, and yes, I'm gonna quiz you right now on the six licenses as soon as I explain them. So the first one we have is CC BY. So basically, that uh, basically tells the reader that you can use this information, you can edit it, you can change it, you can modify it, you can remix it, you can reuse it, as long as you attribute the original author. Then you have CC non-commercial. So you can change this content, you can customize it, whatever or however you want to, but you can't profit from it, okay? So you can't make a slight change in the textbook, slap your name on it, and then say, hey, pay $15 for the textbook that was written by somebody else, okay? So that's non-commercial. Then you have CC by share alike. So that basically says that you can um, edit this information, change it, you can use it however you want to, but whatever that end product is, you have to license it in the same way that the original author did, okay? And then CC BY ND, non-derivative, that basically means that you can use that content, but you can't change it, okay? So you can't edit it, modify, remix it, reuse it, anything like that, all right? Was that clear? Because I'm going to give you a quiz. All right, CC BY. What does that mean again, CC BY? The author. Yes. Attribute. Attribute the author. Yep, yep, but you can, you can do pretty much anything you want to do to it as long as you attribute the original source. What about the second license, CC BY share alike? You can adapt the content but uh, share it as the original author. Right, right, so the license has to be the same license that the original author slapped on that particular textbook or course material. Very good. CC BY ND, non-derivative. That you can't make fundamental changes. Right, right. Exactly. Very good. CC by NC, non-commercial. Can't make a profit. I like that one. Right now, I, I shouldn't say that. CC by NC, share alike. This is a little complicated. Yep. Very good. And then the last license here. Barbara, what are you thinking? <laughs> 
Okay, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Someone want to help Barbara out? Uh huh. Yes. Very good. All right, you got this. You can come up here and teach it. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right, so that, this is kind of the model for open textbooks, right? So we have a funder that comes in and helps to produce and create the content, at least fund the content, I should say, for the open textbook, and the authors are paid in some capacity. So with the Creative Commons license, uh, it enables us to do a variety of things with open textbooks. Once more, you can copy the textbook and use it in any way that you want to. You can share this content with other folks. You can edit it, so you can take out chapters that you don't like. You said you were frustrated with your ebook right now. Maybe there are some chapters that you just don't like. You can take out chapters and perhaps put in your own uh, course materials. Okay? And that goes a lot with mixing or remixing. Okay? You can keep that content, right? and you can use it. And so that brings me to my point of open, what open really means, an open textbook. Open means free. Basically, we're not charging people an arm and a leg to access this information. And they have permission to use it in a way that basically is customizable to their learning experience. Okay? Now, I do want to stress the word open in open textbook or open educational resources. Because I think a lot of times instructors, me included, before I got into this whole open education thing, I thought open education resources or open educational resources, I thought digital resources. They're not exactly the same thing. And so I kind of want to show you guys this video um, from David Wiley, who's kind of like the, the guru in our, our field in open education. He explains the difference between open educational resources and, excuse me, sorry, and digital resources. And I want you to pay close attention to the uh, distinction that he makes. So when we say open educational resources, I think everybody has an intuitive understanding of what educational resources are, right? They're textbooks and videos and syllabi and assessment banks and uh, all, the, all the stuff that you use when you're teaching. But what does open mean? And if this is the only thing that you take away from this whole however long we end up, you, that you end up listening to me jabber on, I hope this is the one thing that you remember. What does open mean? Um, there's some confusion, I think, with the idea that free means open. And, and let me say why I think that that is problematic for them. The entire internet is already free. You don't pay to watch videos on YouTube. You don't pay to read articles on The Guardian. You don't pay to do the overwhelming majority of things you do on the internet. Now, there are some small corners of the internet where you might have to, to pay to get in there. But the overwhelming majority of the internet is already free. If, if all that open meant was free, we wouldn't need a new name. Right. We wouldn't call it open educational resources. We just call it internet resources or online resources or something like that. Because the entire internet's already free. Free is not even interesting. Free is kind of table stakes. Free and what? Free and what? In the case of open, we mean free plus permissions, free plus copyright permissions. And this is so critically important that you're not going to be able to recognize this dead horse by the time we're done beating it here. Free plus permissions. So open, when someone says to you, oh, what does open mean? You say it means two things. Yes, it means free and unfettered access. I don't have to create an account. I don't have to tell you my email address. I don't have to give up my zip code or my gender or something else. I just, I just type in a URL, and there it is. Or I Google search, and I click on the link, and there it is. There's no wall. There's no password. Just free and unfettered access, plus Plus, but th this is 99% of the internet, right, right here. So open means this, plus a perpetual, irrevocable grant, a formal legal grant of copyright permissions that we shorthand as the 5R permissions here. So these are they. So the 5Rs are retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. And, and what these mean, I'm going to put this down for a minute because we're going to spend a moment here. Um, what, what these mean, and retain is the most important one. Um, re retain is fundamental to all of the others working. So in a world of Netflix and Spotify and Hulu and Pandora, in, in a world where you have, without recognizing it maybe even, have stopped owning copies of things and you just pay a monthly fee to be able to stream things, 
that you never own a copy of. Retain means I can actually download a copy, which is mine, which does not delete itself, which does not have an access code that expires, does not go away. It's good, old-fashioned ownership of private property. I have a copy, and it is mine. And I'm the master of that copy. So I can make and keep this copy. And with that copy, then, I have permission to do a whole bunch of things. I can use it in a, in a broad range of ways, including revise means I can open it up and fiddle with its insides. Right? I can take out this example and write a new example and put it in there. I can take out uh, that image, take a new picture, and put that picture inside it. I can, I can translate it into another language. I can adjust the reading level up or down. Uh, I, can, I can localize it, adapt it, modify it, improve it for my own circumstances. I have a formal legal grant of copyright permission to do that. I'm going to stop it right there. So I think that's a great explanation of what you can do with open educational resources. Um, let's see here. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, David Wiley just basically went over the, um, the permissions that we have with open textbooks through the Creative Commons license. Okay. So there are some huge benefits in terms of adopting or using open educational resources in the classroom. It definitely um, uh, decreases some of those barriers that we see to access, right? So it encourages that free exchange of information, which when you think about it, that's what higher education is supposed to be all about, right? Um, also, the content uh, stays in higher education, right? It's offered by those who are affiliated with some type of scholarly institution. Um, from a faculty perspective, I found it very empowering authoring an open textbook. I was able to tailor the content to exactly what I wanted my students to get out of the course. Okay? And not only that, I was able to provide student examples, like exemplary uh, student examples in the textbook, and put it in there instantaneously. Right? So it was very, very empowering for me to use open educational resources in the classroom. And then also, um, a lot of people from very, very prestigious universities are um, authoring open educational resources. These are just some of the universities that are represented through open textbooks. Okay. Um, and so students actually really enjoy um, classrooms or classes that use open educational resources. So I just have one last video for you guys. I do want to show that panel that I was talking about with the Santa Ana uh, students from California. They talked about their experience using open educational resources. I remember this very vividly. Last, last year, fall semester, where I was registering for classes for my fall semester of 2016. And I had realized that I wasn't going to be able to afford one of my textbooks. And just a little bit of background uh, about me. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a full-time student, I'm a stay-at-home dad, and I am married. And all three of us, my wife, my daughter, and I, were surviving on one income. And it's, it's super hard. It's, it's a struggle today. And I, I found out that since I wasn't going to be able to enroll into that course or take that course, I was going to have to push, it, uh, push that course to the next semester. And by pushing it to the next semester, it, it prolonged. Uh, my, my graduation date, would, it, it just uh, fell out of schedule. It, I actually would have, to be, well, I would have to postpone it a full academic year. And, and which was, it was really devastating. It, was, it, it just crushed me. A part of me thought maybe I should just drop out and just go back to work. But you know, I have to watch, you know, I have to take care of my daughter. But as I was looking through the courses, I found an OER course. It satisfied the requirements needed to uh, stay on track with my ed plan. And so the cost benefit of OER, it, it really helped a lot. I was able to stay on track with my ed plan. I was able to graduate from the community college. And I was able to transfer to the university right on schedule. I work at the EOPS Resource Center. And thankfully, they have book loans. They, have, they loan me the calculator. But they also offer um, a limited amount of money for students that are coming in that are in need of um, financial help. The amount is $300. If you're in a macro or microeconomics class, that's about how much that would cost. So I think that the benefit for single parents or stay-at-home parents or parents that are coming back in, um, usually 
for, for, my, for my point of view, from my experience. I came in broken. I had just gotten out of a, a really bad relationship. And when I came in, um, I was broken. And I did not need any, any additional challenges. Going back to school was like my only choice. Because if I didn't go back to school, I would end up working dead end jobs and leaving my children alone most of the time. I didn't want that cycle to continue in my life and in my children's life. So I basically went and I asked for all the help that I could get at Santa Ana College, and they offer a lot of help. But for students that don't have children, for students that are coming back, that are, that are, um, that are students, that DACA students, they don't have all the help that I was able to receive. So $300 does not go a long way when you're a business major. Sometimes students have to choose another major even if they don't want to go into that major just because of, of the financial situation that they're in. And also, some of them just do like quick, um, like the vocational, uh, like the quick uh, careers because of money, because of time. You know, they have to, they have to hurry up. They have to get things done. And it's all back to, because I have to get back to work. So I think that when we do the open, um, the, these OER resources, the fact that one of my classes only cost me five dollars for the book. It was a materials fee. Five dollars, I can get five dollars anywhere. And most of them were free. So for me, uh, that I know a lot of single parents, a lot of them are already taking these classes. And as a single parent, I took these classes. Not because of the money, because at the time I was getting help, um, but now that I'm taking classes that I'm purchasing books for, it's it's a little bit cheaper too. So um, what I think is that these resources are so helpful in so many areas, in so many groups, for so many people. And if you take in consideration to participate and be a part of these books, I mean resources, you would not just be helping one standard student. You would be helping a broad spectrum of students. All right, I'm gonna stop it right there. So I think that's a great point that she made in terms of using OER in the classroom. It can be helpful to a wide variety of students from various different backgrounds. So here's just an example of um, one open textbook, actually two, excuse me, um, the cover and everything. One is from um, SUNY, or both of them, excuse me, are from SUNY, right? And most of these are found online, but you can um, have a print edition as well. Um, this is from OpenStax from Rice University. Um, as you can see, some of them are even coming out with their second edition. And I believe since OpenStax has uh, started, they saved students almost, I think, $150 million, yeah, $155 million since 2012. So that's a lot of money that we're, we're saving our students. It's one last thing, right, that they have to worry about. So now I want to take the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the Open Textbook Network. Okay? So I do want to make this clear, we're not a publishing company. Okay, we are just a community of folks who want to basically try to help support open education programs, whether that is through publishing or authoring or something else. Okay. To date, we've reached about 2,600 faculty um, when we're conducting workshops and what have you. And of those faculty that we've reached, approximately about 40 to 45% do end up adopting some type of open textbook. Um, and the Open Textbook Network basically provides the Open Textbook Library, which I want to actually go ahead and talk about right now. But before I talk about that, I want to pause here and make sure that there aren't any questions, comments. Yes? Do you know what uh, percentage of books and supplies are in the course of, uh, uh, of that particular course? In you say 1,200 tuition for that class, and uh, I think the fraction of the cost would be able to receive those. Right. I don't know that off the top of my head, but that is an interesting question. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, so here's the Open Textbook Library. Um, you can access it actually right now if you'd like to, if you want to follow along with me, open.umn.edu. Um, and the library website should pop up there. We have textbooks from a variety of uh, subject matters, um, anywhere from accounting, business, engineering, communication, um, journalism, uh, human ecology even, education. And they're all openly licensed. If you go to where it says Browse Subject Matters, you can see all the categories that we have here listed. There's an About Us section if you're more interested in learning about the library. And then once you actually click on a textbook, you can see the TOC or the Table of Contents. 
who wrote the book, and the license. Okay. Uh, most of our books are in some type of dual format, and what I mean by dual format, or multiple format, it's either PDF, EPUB, <coughs> right, or just uh, their general website. Um, I, bet, I was trying to understand sort of the structure of, of open text book network because you can find open textbooks in other sort in other places mm -hmm. or whatever. So I, I didn't know what 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 that group or that entity how that was different from other places where you find textbooks. Or yeah, why, that's a really why there's a need for right. something like that. That's a really great question. I think if I go to, I think it's my next slide, I talk about some of the inclusion criteria. That's what makes the Open Textbook Network a little bit different from perhaps OpenStax or some of the other open textbook um, programs that you see. So let me go ahead and actually get to that to answer your question. Um, here's just another example. Um, also, you can see the reviews, right? So if you are concerned about the, the quality or whether or not people actually um, uh, think highly of this textbook, you can go there and access the reviews. These reviews are from faculty, right? So in terms of what's new in the Open Textbook Library, we have approximately 450 to 460 textbooks, which I think is amazing. Very diverse categories here. Not each category, is, each class is represented, but a lot of them are. Uh, there's a huge surge recently in engineering uh, textbooks, so I think that's awesome as well, and also in Spanish language textbooks. So to get to your question, in, in order to submit an open textbook to the Open Textbook Network Library, First of all, it has to be openly licensed, okay? And that includes images, um, videos that you might include in there, right? So for some of the open textbook programs or websites that you might see, that criteria might not apply to images and videos, okay? Also, it has to be portable in a variety of formats and files, right? So the e uh, PDF, EPUB, or online format. You also have to have the complete textbook, not just a you know, draft or halfway uh, finished version, what have you. Um, whoever is writing this open textbook has to be affiliated with some type of academic or scholarly institution. So that's a huge distinction between the open textbook network and other um, open textbook uh, programs that you might see. And then the actual textbook in itself has to be an original product. So we're not looking for like a culmination of like different articles that you kind of just put together like a course packet, right? We're not looking for anything like that. It has to be an original production, an original project. Okay. So does that mean that the openly licensed that you couldn't refer them to, say, a YouTube video because that would be free but not have the permission? That, that's that a work? good question. I'm going to ask, Michelle, do you know what, yeah. yeah. Repeat the question. Can you repeat the question one more time? Um, the uh, openly licensed, does that mean uh, With that the, you couldn't like, refer to a send them to a YouTube video because that's free but not, you don't have permissions on that. But, and I guess, relatedly, it's right. it's very difficult to find images. Uh, you can you can search, say, within Google Image yeah. for openly licensed ones, but they're not organized or tagged very well. So I'm just yeah. curious about some of the pragmatics of that. Right, so um, as far as, creation of open materials. I, I'm sure that Chris Camille is, could help you understand some of the copyright issues related to that. As far as what goes into the library though, um, like typically videos aren't there. And so I guess I'm, I'm having trouble understanding yeah, the me connection too. between yeah. the <coughs> So basically, if you, were, if you were to embed a YouTube video, like let's say you wanted to, right, could you actually put that in your open textbook and then submit that to the open textbook library? That's what you're asking. Yes, I, I guess because, I mean, if it's PDF or other formats, they can just click on the link. I guess if it's, right. if you downloaded it, you you have to type in. Yeah, that. yeah. I think that's a really good question. I don't want to answer it for sure because I don't want to mislead you. Let me get back to you. Let me verify that information. But to my knowledge and some of the other open textbooks that do have videos, it's original production. So they're not linking out to another YouTube video. So that's why I want to say it's, it's a no, but I, want, I don't want to say for sure, for sure. So other questions about anything? Yes. Like an open uh, source for Yes, not on the open textbook. 
not on the Open Textbook um, Network Library, but you can go to the Creative Commons uh, website. There's another one that I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Um, you can go to Google Images, but like you were saying, it, it's kind of weird to kind of filter out everything, but I recommend the Creative Commons. Any other questions? Yes? This might be too big of a question. No, that, it's fine. Do you know how schools are reacting as far as tenure? As far as, far as what? As tenure granting goes yeah. to open access and like what the kind of general trend there is? Um, to be quite honest with you, I know there's, I wouldn't say there's a resistance, but you know, as we all know, in academia, change comes slow. Yeah. So <laughs> I wouldn't say that there is a complete resistance against that, but I also wouldn't say that there is a complete, let's, let's, let's do this. Let's yeah. include that in the, in the TNP. And that is a real concern for a lot of faculty. Are the bookstores one of those big ones? Um, uh, yes and no. It, it depends upon your respective university, to be honest with you, but it, it is something that we have to consider. Because I think in our case, yeah. uh, our dean pushed ourselves to make sure that the book is, uh, that the students know it's in the bookstore. Right. To buy it there. Right, right. Because they get a cut. Yeah, to, yeah. To, in order to fund underprivileged students. Yep. Say. Yep, absolutely. And I, uh, I don't know if that seems kind of backwards. Yeah, and then a lot of the textbooks that you find in the Open Textbook Network Library, you can, you know, print them off through your bookstore and, and put them there. I mean, I would imagine a lot of our students are going to online resources anyways. They're not actually stepping foot, unfortunately, in, in the bookstore. So that's one way that you can still participate with the bookstore by having those print copies available of the Open Textbook. Yes? I just want to add that um, our bookstore here is very supportive of what we're doing at OERs. And alternative textbooks, so if you have any concerns, I would talk to Tori Sage, she's the manager there. Um, so I know there are people on campus who are adopting OERs, so, um, or talk to Camille or I um, about it. Yeah, we're not in the business of wiping out campus bookstores. I just want to make that clear as well. We do want to work with them, absolutely. I'm curious, with the, yeah. these open access, do they come with, um, let's say, test banks? Great question. Like, some of them do, to be quite honest with you, that is an area that we, we really need. More test banks, more online, perhaps homeworks, uh, homework packets, um, auxiliary packets, you know, course materials. And, you know, to be honest with you, a lot of the, the textbooks that you see here, they, they don't unfortunately have that, that um, corresponding packet. Some do, but not all of them. So. Other questions? All right, so uh, I do want to talk a little bit more about the quality of the open textbooks uh, in the open te textbook library. So I'm not going to sit up here and say these are high quality textbooks. Why am I not going to say that? Because I'm not an expert in your field. I'm not an expert in your field. I'm not an expert in your field. I can only speak to communication. Okay? But I can say based upon the faculty reviews, this is what we've received so far. So on a scale from one to five, about 640 reviews did um, basically um, give the textbooks 4.5 to 5 um, on, on the five point scale. So I think that's pretty good, you know. Not all of the textbooks are great, okay, that's not what I'm trying to promote here. But a, a, a wide variety of them based upon faculty reviews are, are pretty, pretty decent, okay. Also going along the lines of OER quality, there's a lot of research behind OER in terms of whether or not there are quality open educational resources out there. So based upon 12 peer review studies um, that basically uh, surveyed, I believe it was, yes, 5,000 professors and students, they, they looked at their perception of open educational resources. They found that about half of them thought that open educational resources were just about the same quality-wise compared to traditional textbooks or traditional materials. About a third of them thought that they were better. And then a small fraction were like, eh, I don't really like them, okay? So that's across 5,000 professors and students. Just to kind of zero in on this a little bit more, this is from a specific class that used an open textbook. So comparing it to other uh, courses that use traditional textbooks, they thought this particular textbook, they meaning the students, that it was much better than other courses. Now granted, we're only talking about 49 students, so the sample size is very, very limited here. 
They thought it was extremely relevant to the course content, and that's one great benefit of open textbooks. You can tailor that content to whatever you want your students to engage with. And of course, they're going to say that it was a good value for the price. Okay, it's free. Here's some open-ended feedback from that same class that used the open textbook. You can read this to yourselves. It's actually kind of funny. Yeah, students are becoming more aware of those instructors who are using OER in the classroom, and they're actually, some of them are actually really liking that. In terms of the effectiveness of OER, right, so what kind of academic impact does OER have on our students? Uh, based upon 13 peer-reviewed studies, 120, almost 1,000 students, um, academically, OER, or those classes that use OER, um, those students fare just as well, if not better, than those students who were in classrooms that use traditional textbooks or traditional materials. So in other words, guys, we're not putting our students at an academic detriment when we're using OER in the classroom based upon the data here. Okay. If you are interested in more research regarding open educational resources, come talk to me after the workshop. There is a particular group that conducts research over this subject matter. Here's another example of an open textbook that is more comprehensive. I think you asked for like, you know, that auxiliary homework packet. Um, this particular textbook has that. It's in a variety of formats. There's an instructor solution manual. There's PowerPoints, right? So this is a very, very, very comprehensive open textbook. Almost looks like a traditional textbook, right? And then I do want to talk a little bit more about how you can customize content in an open textbook. Um, here is one example in which, again, it's a share-like example, in which you can customize um, information based upon what you want your students to take away from the classroom. This particular textbook was modified and revised. And I think a more tangible example, if you are part of the Open Textbook Network as a member, you get access to a platform called Pressbooks. Um, that is the platform that I use to author my open textbook. And what you can do is copy and paste the link to an open textbook that was created through Pressbooks, clone it, and then you have access to all that information. You can go in on the back end and edit it, take out chapters, put in the materials, right? So I think that's a really, really, really cool way to where you can customize the content in an open textbook. Right? And again, that platform was called Pressbooks. Yes. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. And then just to brag one more time about my university, we do have an affordable learning program at Ohio State in which we enable instructors to use OER in the classroom, to author OER, and by the end of this past year, we actually saved students in this year alone $1 million. And so I challenge you all here at Texas Tech to kind of do the same thing. Okay, save our students a lot of money by at least trying to cut down the cost in some capacity. There is one professor here who's already doing that, Dr. Griffith. She's a contributing author to an open textbook um, that is in the open textbook library. Okay. So it seems like it is definitely happening here at Texas Tech. So all I want you guys to do, honestly, is just to take a look at what's in the catalog right now and give us feedback. We need your feedback. We really, 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 really do. Um, at the end of this workshop, not immediately at the end, but you will hopefully provide a review to us. Um, also, make sure that you tell your colleagues about open educational resources. So some of you guys might be sitting here thinking, oh, I'm not sure if this is for me. At least spread that awareness that this resource is available to you guys. <coughs> Um, speaking of that review, and maybe Camille can speak to this a little bit more, um, there will be stipends paid for for attending this workshop and for reviewing the open textbook library, or particular textbook. And I'm not sure when that review needs to be finalized, Camille. Uh, I was March 16th. March 16th, okay, I'm sorry, I put March 27th. Okay. Yes? Will this cover the 
Yes. Yeah. Or in terms of like, will I explain that? Well, the difference from some sources, when, I, when I've done reviews for others, that, that concise difference has been uh, different. Oh, yeah. Other words that you've found. Absolutely. That's going to be explained to you in an email. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Anything else? Well, honestly, guys, that is all I have. You were a fun group of people to talk to, I must say. And hopefully you took something away uh, regarding open educational resources. Thank you so much. <laughs>